chapter 1, Galatians 1, and we have a special reading from Chiang Mai this morning. So this is Pete and Mel Sharp's uh, two daughters. Uh, so let this be a reminder to pray for them and uh, to remind you about our offering as well. So we have an online offering, um, or there's also a box that's available in the back uh, to put your offering in as well if you don't do it online. So don't forget to do that. And uh, after we have the Bob Marino pray, and we'll thank God for what we've been receiving from him all the time. It's all his. We're just stewards of what he's given. So, um, yeah. So let's hit that video. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Galatians 1, 10 to 24. But am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. But I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely je zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what, I, what, in what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy and they glorified God because of me. All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how real and living and active it is. Lord, thank you that it cuts to the deepest part of our heart, our intentions and our thoughts and all that. And we just pray, Lord, that you would do that with us this morning. Lord, thank you for the offering that we receive. Uh, Lord, please use it to your glory around the world and here at home as well. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that we can bless people like the Sharps. We do pray for them and, and the work that they're doing, so important uh, for pioneers. And we just pray, Lord, that you'd empower them, um, you'd encourage them in this time of being away from family and wishing they could get back, um, make, meet their financial needs as well. And uh, we just thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Mom, can you put that light back on? Then? Oh, great. Okay, Galatians chapter 1, which was just read by beautiful Pete and Mel's daughters. Jesus Christ is for everyone. I think my title this morning is The Gospel for All. And that's a foundational Christian statement, isn't it? I hope that you're pleased to hear me say that. And I'm sure you'd be pleased to hear anyone say that, that Jesus Christ is for everyone. Not just good-looking church people, but for everyone, right? Not just people in Perth, but people in Myanmar, people in Chiang Mai, people in wherever you are, Jesus Christ is for everyone. But what if someone who said that, at the very same time as they went on to explain that, in fact, were taking people away from Jesus? So the Sharps read the text this morning. It speaks of the travels of one man, Paul, a long time ago, first century. And it speaks about some church politics that was going, some, some, some relational difficulties going on, uh, some gospel difficulties in that early church. And you might think, well, why are we studying this today? Why are we reading this? What's it got to do with me in the, in the 21st century all these years later? Well, look down in your Bibles, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 5, and I meant to get this far today, but I won't. I'll get this far next week. But here we see Paul's aim, his goal. So chapter 2, verse 5, his goal is that the church of the gospel, so the truth of the gospel, might be preserved for you. 
the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And of course, the you in the first instance is the Galatians, but it's also for us, for us. And that's what was under threat all those years ago, even by those who would say very happily, well, the gospel's for everyone. They didn't really mean that. So second week in our studies in Galatians, um, Galatia is a region in what's now Turkey, and Paul had been there preaching the gospel fairly soon after he wrote this letter. And we saw last week that there's a real urgency, there's a, there's a real passion about this letter because all is not well in this church in Galatia. And that's because they were hearing, uh, some were teaching a different gospel, he calls it in chapter 1 there. Now, one way that the gospel was being undermined, it seems, was that those coming in were undermining the messenger. They were undermining Paul and his authority. And, and therefore, if they, if they could chip away at that foundation, they could undermine the whole gospel. Sometimes we hear this false idea that Paul is the real inventor of uh, the gospel, of, of the Christianity that we know today. And they'll say, well, you know, he was an innovator, Paul. Uh, he came up with a new message. He, he reinvented the message of Jesus. And he came up with something altogether different from Jesus. And in that kind of popular idea, they'll say, well, Jesus, he taught a message about the kingdom. He taught a message about the poor and about the dangers of corruption and the dangers of riches. And he taught a message of doing good to your neighbor and loving one another. And by Im imitating Jesus and following him, we attain to the kingdom. And we, we, we please God. But Paul, they say, well, Paul came up with a different message altogether. Uh, they'll say, well, he did away with that teaching about the kingdom and about good works. And he introduced an altogether different message, an un-Jewish message, a message that the opponents say, it doesn't matter what you do or what you say or what you think. You can just reject God and freely get into heaven easily, right? So these people will say this idea of, for example, justification by faith alone, in Christ alone. Well, that's completely Paul's idea, they'll say. Uh, it's a dangerous idea, and, and, and it leads people away from doing good things. I don't know if you've come across that idea before. I'm sure you have. If you haven't yet, you will. And it's not just the doctrine of justification by faith. You'll hear it, too, in debates about sexuality. Oh, yes, they'll say. Paul wrote that in Romans chapter 1 about homosexuality and then God's you know, will for sexuality, but Jesus will say, love one another. And they try to pit what Jesus says against what Paul says. Or in the debates about the roles of men and women in the church, they'll say, well, yeah, yeah, Paul did say that in 1 Timothy, uh, but Jesus says this. And it's almost enough in some of these theological circles that when somebody points out what the Bible says, they'll say, well, that was Paul, you know, and, and they can feel like they're just striking off uh, God's word there. I was talking to the elders yesterday as we had our prayer time about how I kind of dislike this idea of a red letter Bible. I know my Bible, or most Bibles these days have the words of Christ in red. It's, it's actually very hard to find a Bible these days that's a black letter, all, you know, all black letter Bible. It's not that it's a heretical thing. It's just that the publishers are saying, okay, we want to highlight for you Jesus' words. There's the stuff that Jesus said. Oh, but there's the stuff that he didn't say. And that's in black over here. And it kind of teaches a, no, I think it's a bit of a false idea about God's word. It'd be nice, although I'm colorblind, so it'd be kind of hard for me to read it. But if the whole Bible was in red, you know, and you could still have on the spine words of Christ in red, right? But it'd be the whole thing, because the whole thing is God's word, right? And we need to get that idea. So as we see in Galatians, they were undermining Paul and his message and his, his authority as, as, as an apostle. And they were saying, if we can't trust Paul, well, then we can do away with his, his message. And because of that, we get in this chapter, chapter 1, <clears throat> quite a lengthy defense of Paul's uh, apostleship and of his conversion and, of course, of what he's saying in this message. Because after all, they're probably saying, well, Paul wasn't there with Jesus. He wasn't one of the 12 during that time of ministry. And that's true. He wasn't there. So uh, how can you trust that what Paul is saying is really 
Jesus' message. Or maybe we should go back to those Jerusalem elders and those apostles who are with Jesus. Maybe they could help us get to the real message. Maybe they could correct the wrong things that the Apostle Paul was saying. Um, so you can't trust him. That's what the opponents were, were um, opposing Paul with. So the question is then, how can we trust Paul's message? How can we trust what it says in Galatians that what Paul is preaching is from God? So verse 1, we saw this last week in chapter 1. Paul's on the front foot right away. He says, Paul, an apostle. You know, that means a sent one from God. An apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. And the point is, this gospel I'm preaching was not invented by men. It wasn't invented by me. It wasn't invented by any human source. It comes from God. And straight away, he's, he's really emphasizing the rightful authority of his message and what he's saying. It comes from God. And of course, he knows that he wasn't around during Jesus' ministry for three years, but he was an apostle. I think in 1 Corinthians 15, it says he was one who was untimely born. You know, but he was still an apostle, and God sent him to explain authoritatively the significance of the, the death and the resurrection of Christ, and he had the message of good news. So verse 1, that's verse 1, and that's a bit of a preview of what's to come in chapter 1 uh, from Paul. Now, I meant to give you two points today, um, but as I get into it this week, I just, uh, so much I want to say. So just one point, but I'll, I'll say a few things about this one point. And the point is, in your notes, if you have the, the bulletin, the gospel, this gospel, is God's gospel. It comes from God. It doesn't come from Paul. It's God's gospel. So verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. It doesn't originate in human beings in that sense. It's not that we invented this. For, verse 12, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. He didn't get it from the other apostles. Uh, he didn't get it from anybody else. Uh, he, he didn't receive it from them. How did he get it? He says, I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, when did that happen? When did Jesus reveal himself to the Apostle Paul? Acts chapter 9. You can read this later. <clears throat> Paul was confronted by the living, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus. And there Paul heard and he received the gospel directly from God himself. But somebody might say, okay, well, Paul, you say that Jesus revealed himself directly to you in Acts 9. But how do we know that you're really telling the truth? How do we know that the risen Jesus Christ truly appeared to you and that you really were converted on that road to Damascus? How do we know that you're not making this stuff up? So Paul answers with verse 13 and following, that whole paragraph. And his logic seems to be that we know God must have revealed himself to Paul because, well, look at the dramatic change in his life. Look at the dramatic turnaround in his life. It was a complete U-turn in Paul's life. And so Paul says, here is exhibit number one. And it's me, Paul says. It's my life. That's how you know this is true. So it's, it's his testimony. It's his story. There's a before part in this passage. There's a what happened to him part. And then there's the after part as well, after he was saved. So the first part is the before part, verses 13 and 14. Notice the word for in your Bible. A little three-letter word, verse 13, for or because. He's giving us evidence that verse 12, this, this good news message came from God, not man. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among my, my people, so extremely zealous was I for the tradition of my fathers. So he's saying a couple of things here. He's saying, number one, you must have heard of me. You might not know me personally, but you must have heard my story. Surely you know my story. You could never accuse me of not being a committed Jew, Paul is saying. He was a Jew of Jews. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, I was a Pharisee. I was strongly committed to this, this Old Testament law. 
Um, I was far ahead, verse uh, 14, of my contemporaries, but I was so zealous of the Jewish Pharisee, so committed to Judaism, that it was my desire to stamp out the church, this new, brand new Christian message. I wanted to destroy Christianity. So you can't accuse Paul of not knowing the scriptures. You can't accuse Paul of not knowing the Bible or not being a committed Jew. There was no one so committed to the cause as Paul was. By the way, I didn't have this in my notes, but um, I remember somebody saying that you can be totally zealous like Paul was, totally committed to the cause. You, you can be so studied and so in the word, and yet you can be mistaken. There's a lesson here for us. No one knew as much as Paul did back then. He really studied under Gamaliel and all those people, but he was totally mistaken about what God's word said and what it meant. So verse 15, here's the but. I like those words, but, because it means God changes everything. He, just, he intervenes. Verse 15, here's the what happened part. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. So there's this dramatic intervention of God in his life. Now remember, Paul was God's enemy. Paul was a violent man. He violently hurt and killed Christians. And Jesus even says to him on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, that's what he was called before, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul says, well, I'm, you know, I'm persecuting the church. Jesus says, you're, you're hurting me. It's my body. That's where Paul was. But God, and God graciously reaches out to Paul. Verse 15, he called me by his grace. Grace. It's obviously undeserved kindness. God revealed himself to Paul in the Lord Jesus Christ on that Damascus road. He calls Paul, and when the Bible talks about this kind of calling... You answer. It's effectual calling. He opens your heart and you answer. He called me by his grace. And this grace, this undeserved, unmerited favor is going to be key in the rest of Galatians. God doesn't reveal himself to Paul when he was attractive. He doesn't reveal himself to Paul when, when Paul was lovely. Well, there's a there's a man that I want to have on my team who deserves rescue. No, not, not at all. It's while Paul was still a sinner, unlovely, an enemy of God, on the road to Damascus to hurt some more Christians, that God intervenes in his life. Undeserved, unmerited. He didn't earn this. You know, he didn't do some good work, so God said, okay, you've crossed the line now. You've made it. It wasn't that way at all. He was dead in his trespasses and sins. And this grace will be really important in the rest of Galatians. Let me stop right there and just say this. Are you like Paul? You were, right? You were like Paul. You say, well, I wasn't persecuting the church, but all of us in some way have rebelled against God. And our story may not be exactly the same as Paul's. Our conversion may not have been as dramatic uh, maybe it was displayed in a different way, our hostility towards God. Maybe in more respectable kind of ways if you've grown up in a church. And yet every Christian who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ has experienced this undeserved grace of Christ drawing them. And if you're not a Christian today, you say, well, I'm too far. You're not too far. You're not too far. If God can pull the Apostle Paul into himself when he's persecuting the church, he's God's enemy, he can take you. You know, his mercy is more. We sing that all the time, don't we? So that's the problem in Galatia. Grace was under threat. They were in danger of turning to a different gospel and away from grace. So, you know, some similarities between us and Paul, but also some quite unique differences as well. Uh, verse 15, Paul says, God had set him apart before he was born, or more literally, from my mother's womb. Now, think about this for a moment. It's striking because if you knew the Paul of before, it didn't really look like he was set apart by God at all. You know, This is the man who for years and years was using all his energy and time to hurt the church and kill Christians. But Paul says, God had already set me apart before I was born. When I was in my mother's womb, he'd set me apart. I think there's a lesson here for 
us pro-lifers as well, right? That personhood and God's plans for, for human beings starts before birth, you know? We're, we're different, unique people way back then. But there's a lot here to this. If you know your Old Testament fairly well, you might have noticed that Paul is saying something here that the Old Testament prophets would say quite often. So you get Jeremiah. Here's Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah says in chapter 1, God says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Right? And so Jeremiah is able to say, Thus says the Lord. He speaks God's word. Or Isaiah. This is Isaiah chapter 49. He uses the same language. He says, The Lord called me from the womb. Before I was born. So what's Paul doing here? He's saying, I'm in the same category as these Old Testament prophets who spoke God's word. I'm an apostle speaking God's word as well. Do you see that? He's in the same category. So it, you, you can't say Isaiah is more important than Paul or Paul is more. They're all in that same category speaking God's word. And he's able to declare this is the gospel. So exhibit one. How do we know this message is from God that's supernatural and that Paul didn't just invent it? Well, look at Paul's changed life, right? Now think about verse 13 again. Paul says, you've heard about my former life. You probably, you, you know my basic biography. I'm sure Paul says, I was once a persecutor, a murderer. I was as zealous as they come. I was a Jewish Pharisee. I set out to stamp out the Christian message. Ah, uh, but now I'm someone who's going around preaching the good news of Jesus. And you must have heard about that because I'm pretty famous for those two things. I was a persecutor, and now I'm a preacher, right? And that's his story. And so we see at the end of chapter 1, even though the Christians of the churches in Judea didn't know Paul personally, they had heard. They knew who he was. Verse 23, they only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. So everyone knows that about me, Paul says. And he argues that change is so spectacular that it only makes sense if God is behind it. God must be the one who changed my life and turned me around. Sometimes we use that argument to talk about creation. I use this argument quite often as well about the creation of the universe. I like these arguments. God must have created the universe because if you compare the before and the after picture, something very supernatural must have taken place. It couldn't be by chance. So the very famous illustration is about the watch keeper and the watch. Imagine somebody walks into a room and they notice this beautiful watch. It's, a, it's an amazing timepiece and it's keeping great time. How did this watch come about, you say? Well... The wind was blowing, and in the wind were these little gear pieces and these teeth and the spring, and they were just kind of blowing around in the wind. And, and, and the cogs just happened to line up in the right formation all at once, and, and the, the gears and the teeth, they all just fit together properly all at once. And that spring, it just happened to coil itself up, and, and the watch started ticking, and voila, there it is by chance. The argument is how ridiculous that idea is. To go from random cogs and springs and all that to a watch that keeps perfect time, it's extraordinary. A watchmaker must have been involved, is the lesson, right? How much more the universe? How much more the universe, which is so complex and so beautiful and so ordered? The, the, the British astronomer, Sir Fred Hoyle, uh, who wasn't a Christian, um, but he wasn't an atheist at, at all, and he says this. He says, even just a simple cell coming about by random chance is like suggesting that a tornado swept through a junkyard and assembled a Boeing 747 from all the materials therein. He said, he compared the chance of obtaining even a single functioning protein by chance uh, by, uh, as a, a, a solar system full of blind men solving Rubik's Cubes simultaneously. Um, that kind of change just doesn't happen by chance. You can't explain it that way. That's the creation. How much more the new creation? How much more lives like Andrew's this morning talking about his life that was changed? 
and your life. And I'm sure you know people and you know yourself that supernatural change from God. So that's Paul's argument. How do you know this didn't just originate from men? Well, look at the miraculous change in my life. Had you met Paul before his conversion, you would have thought, there's no hope for him. We have those categories, I'm sure you do in your mind, about people that you are thinking about. And you say, well, there's no hope for her. There's no hope for him. Paul was in that category. People would look at Paul and say, there's no hope from him, for, for him. And God changed him. And Paul says, don't you see? Don't you see what took place? This must have been God at work. This is great ammunition to use against our doubts. I know um, uh, we were thinking about this yesterday as well. Ammunition against our doubts. And I think all of us, I think most of us have doubts from time to time. Um, and there are all sorts of things you can do to combat uh, your doubts. Um, one thing to do is to think about, okay, well, does the alternative view make any sense? And I can go through all types of things and say, the alternative is rubbish. You know, it just doesn't make sense if it wasn't for the fact that God created us and changed us and so on. So, you know, here's a complex, ordered world that we see around us. The other view is, well, it just happened by chance. That's ridiculous. Or, or here are four gospel accounts that, that harmonize so perfectly. It, it didn't happen randomly like that. Or here are persecuted Christians who die for this message that they believe in and that they wrote like the apostles. If they're not telling the truth, well, what's the alternative? It, it doesn't make any sense. So here's one thing we can do. If this isn't true, then how else do we explain the complete change in people's lives when they're converted to Christ? How do you do that? How do you explain that? And not just that, but they will go and face persecution like Paul did, believing on these things. If, you're, if you've been a Christian for a while, you've probably had the privilege of, of seeing an unbeliever totally change you know, in their lives. Who, who before cared nothing for spiritual things, no desire for God whatsoever, dismissive of God, a, a God-hater even. And then there's this huge transformation that takes place in their lives through the Holy Spirit. So use this as ammunition against your doubts. Second application, Paul's dramatic conversion points us to the power of God's grace. Doesn't it? It really does. Had you met Paul before his conversion, like I said, you would have said there's no hope. But now look at what God's done in his life. So Paul's conversion reminds us of God's power to turn around the most unlikely of people. No one, no one is beyond God's reach. And if God can save Paul, well, what about that family member that you've been praying for for decades? Or what about your unbelieving spouse? What about your children who aren't walking with the Lord? What about you, yourself? Never give up praying for those who seem impossible to reach. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation uh, is ultimately a miracle. It's a work of God. It can't be calculated. It can't be predicted. It can't be manipulated. And God in his sovereignty reveals his son to Paul on the road to Damascus and by his grace and mercy still saves today. It's not something that you deserve. No one deserves to be called by God. And all of us rightfully stand under God's judgment apart from Christ. But God who's rich in mercy, amen, rich in mercy, has reasons beyond our understanding, still calls people to himself, the most unlikely people, to salvation by his grace. It's a gift. So let's be filled with faith in God and thanks and praise for his wonderful transforming grace. Let's marvel that God still saves sinners who are filled with hatred towards him, and that's all due to the power of his grace. So exhibit number one, Paul says, my changed life, and it, it shows the, the power of the gospel. It also shows evidence of his apostleship. And Paul goes on to explain what happened next in verse 16. God set him apart and called him by his grace for what purpose? 
God was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So God calls Paul, this is in Damascus, on the road to Damascus, he's saved, and set him apart to do what? To preach the gospel, especially to the Gentiles. That was his unique commission. And, and note the, the focus isn't on some personal benefit that Paul was going to get from this. In fact, the main thing he got was persecution, stonings all the time, and shipwrecks, and beatings, and all that. But the emphasis here is on this is what God called him to do. And when God calls you to do something, you do it. And he preaches the gospel to the Gentiles, to the nations. Verse 17 mentions Arabia. He writes, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem. So he says, you know, I, wasn't, I wasn't influenced by anybody, not even the apostles. I wasn't influenced by them. I, I didn't take their message and tweak it. I, I didn't turn things around. I didn't even go to Jerusalem. Um, I went into Arabia. He said, well, why, why Arabia? Um, one answer has to be he went there to preach Jesus because that was his commission, right? He was already preaching Jesus in Damascus as a newly saved young man, or however old he was. So he goes to Arabia now, where Gentiles are, and he preaches Christ. Some people say, well, maybe he went there for three years to, uh, to be uh, taught by Jesus. It's just that the Bible doesn't actually say that. That might be a good thing, might have happened. But the Bible doesn't say that. It just says you're called to preach, and he goes to Arabia. But I think the point is here, in Galatians, Arabia is far away from Jerusalem. So he wasn't influenced by anybody else. Uh, if you're looking for a place far away, then Arabia is a great place. So the point is, the gospel is not man's gospel. No one here made this stuff up. It comes from God. It's powerful. It's life-changing. It changed my life, Paul says. If you want evidence, look at me. Verse 18. Hurrying on here. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to, to visit Cephas, that's Peter, and remained, in, remained with him 15 days. So after three years, finally, he, he's away from the apostles. Um, he knew the gospel. He knew the message because God had revealed it to him. And only after that, he heads to Jerusalem and he meets Cephas, uh, or Peter, um, and that was his only contact with Peter. A uh, very, very short contact as well at that point. And then later on, he had contact with James, but he only saw him, Paul says. So what's Paul saying here? Do you get the point? He's saying that all of this, it was too late. It was three years later, far too brief for anyone to say Paul's message was an evolution or a change or a tweaking of the apostles' message. Um, verse 21, he says, Then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still a known in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They didn't even know me. They heard of me, but they didn't know me. Verse 23, they were only hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. So, so more evidence about this dramatic transformation in his life. Now, just to close, this is why I'm only doing one point. Remember why he's recounting all these details. Verse, uh, verse 11 and 12. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. Right? I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so the Galatians, therefore, can be sure, they can be certain that this message was not invented by Paul. It wasn't a uh, a tweaking or, or a change of, of something. He hadn't misheard it. Uh, he, he hadn't given it its own spin, his own spin. What Paul says comes directly from God, and God's gospel was Paul's gospel. Paul's gospel was God's gospel. So verse 24, the end is, they glorified God because of me. Another striking, bold statement. He's not actually trying to draw attention to himself or puff himself up. He's saying, this response is right because it leads to God being glorified. Anything we do that leads to us being glorified or me or dad or Tom, that's not right. But this leads to God getting the glory because it's not 
our works. It's God's work in us that saves us. So God gets the glory, not me, not you. It's God's gospel. Now, I wanted to get here, but I can't until next week. Paul then shows us that this gospel is the gospel for the nations, for us. That's, we're pretty much all Gentiles here. This gospel is for all of us, not just for a select few, but for everyone. And Abraham's promise, you know, Abraham gets his promise, I'll bless all the nations through you, Abraham, through your seed. It happens through you, Jesus, through the gospel. And we'll get there next week. Let's pray. Oh, this is good stuff, Lord. We just thank you for your word. Thank you for saving us. And Lord, we are all in that situation where we are unlikely converts. We had no hope without the Lord Jesus intervening in our hearts. So Lord, we thank you for that. We glorify you. We praise you for that. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here who's, is, who's saying to themselves, Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm too far gone. Lord, may this be evidence that no one is beyond your grace and your mercy. Um, help us to turn to you in faith and, and know, Lord, that you love us and care for us. And may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.